with street demonstrations and protests, which started as from April 28th, caused by a tax reform bill, which was very unpopular. Most experts and analysts claim that what is happening in Colombia is not just of the current moment, but needs to be understood as the result or the outcome of more deeper structural challenges like high levels of inequality and corruption. These are problems which President Duque himself has recognized since he became president in 2018. We remember the protests in November 2019 and other expressions of discontent in Colombia. The pandemic and itself has had a great impact on the economy, which was, the economy was reduced last year almost by 7% and poverty has now gone above 40% according to Dani. There are 7% more poverty and backsliding to the levels of poverty of 2010 in Cali in particularly, which has been the epicenter of the protests, the numbers are alarming. With blocked roads resulting in an almost paralysis of the economic activity and growing levels of unemployment. The economic cost has been huge. There has also been a great human cost it's of great concern that there are reports, very credible reports from independent groups about violations of human rights committed by the uh, public order forces, especially the police force, resulting in significant number of deaths disappeared and hundreds of thousands of wounded. The situation regarding human rights has been condemned by United Nations, the Organization of American States, the European Union, and many voices here in Washington. There have been attempts at dialogue to seek a solution to the crisis, but so far we are far from reaching an agreement to calm the situation. Happily, we are pleased to have with us four panelists, excellent and interesting panelists, who will share with us their points of view on different aspects of the situation in Colombia. Alejandro Santos is director of Radio Caracol Prisa and ex-president and director of Semana, a position which he has had held for 20 years. It's always a pleasure to have Alejandro with us. Paula Moreno is president of Manos Visibles and former minister of culture in Colombia and member of the Inter-American Dialogue. It's a great pleasure to have Paula with us. It's also a pleasure to have Maurice Armitage, former mayor of Cali, Colombia, from 2016 to 2019 and president of the CDOC Board of Directors. I think it's the first time that we have Maurice with us at an event in the dialogue and we are very pleased to have him with us. And finally, Catalina Botero, currently co-chair of Facebook Oversight Board, expert at Colombia Global Freedom of Expression ex reporter for freedom of expression, ex dean of School of Law of University Los Andes and member of the Inter-American Dialogue. We invite all participants to send questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom or by email to meetings at the dialogue.org. You can follow the event on Twitter with hashtag protest Colombia at the, or at the dialogue. The event will be held in Spanish and there is simultaneous interpretation to English available 
on the Zoom platform. Just click on the interpretation button and you will be able to select English or Spanish channel or original audio without interpretation. Before going on to the question sessions, which I will ask each panelist, then I will open the floor to the public to participate. And I want to thank my colleague Denise Janovich from the dialogue for the idea of this panel and her great support and commitment to her country and her passion for Cali, her native city. Thank you also to Sofia Lalinde for also from Colombia for organizing this event. The format is I'm going to ask each of the four panelists a question and then we will open it to the public. We will begin with Alejandro. Alejandro, could you explain to us what's going on in Colombia? Put the current situation in perspective. How do you see the situation? There are protests, pacific protests, peaceful protests with legitimate claims and demands, but also, as many people have noted, there's a lot of vandalism and destruction. So it's a complex situation, but perhaps you can share with us how you see the situation in the country and the role played by the government, not only the government, but also political parties, civil society, the media. How have they responded to this complex situation that Colombia is facing, Alejandro? Thank you, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be at the dialogue reflecting on these challenges, which are so complex. In this protest, this social protest, there are many actors and we could I clearly identify some protagonists, perhaps the main ones have been youth who have protested mainly peacefully. On the other hand, we have a, a, a strike committee made up of important unions in the country which are negotiating with the government and on the other hand we have as an issue of illegal vandalism and blockades throughout the national territory. I just want for discussion, want to make some points which I think are relevant. They're generic, but important. And they are elements that help the analysis. Colombia has been a country which has struggled against adversity, but where there has always been a dialogue of enemies in the past 35 years or so, thanks to that enemy, the drug dealers, Escobar, the drug cartels in the 80, in the 90s, this offensive from the FARC and kidnapping, which traumatized Colombian society and took them to the streets. And then the paramilitary issue, this self-defense that ended up in a barbaric massacre in Colombia. There has always been visible enemies, almost palpable, a threat to democracy. And this enabled certain social and political cohesion to reject and confront this violent threat against institutionality. Now, everything is different. I think that today we don't have that almost personified enemy, but there's a society which is looking at its own reflection of its own contradictions, inequalities, and insecurities as a society. And what they lack or have not done yet in order to be a more equitable and tolerant society. Here I want to mention that all throughout these years and after a violent 80s, we managed to have a constitution. This was a social pact, which was really a pact with society in Colombia. It's a constitution which is progressive, gives guarantees, 
has the rule of law, has participative democracy and reflects this multicultural society which is in the street today. And I'm talking about this because of the mirror with Chile, Chile, where we see the news about the constitution, the people who are going to develop the new constitution have just been vo voted for and they're going to make a new constitution and leave behind the Pinochet era. I think this is important to mention because these social struggles have dynamics which are social and political. And what we have here is this social contract which is very well consolidated and democratic. On the other hand, I would say that we cannot see Colombia's issue without also understanding the international situation and certain crises which add to this. One is the crisis of democracy, which is not only in Colombia, representative democracy is in crisis. It's been happening throughout the world in the USA with popul rise of populism, Donald Trump in Europe. There's democracy is in crisis. We won't go into detail now about that. And this cri democracy in crisis is reflected by political parties which are not channeling their demands in this manner. There's also a middle class crisis. Middle class protested around the world pre-pandemic and now they still are expressing themselves but with the added ingredient that not only their dreams were blocked but the middle class became poorer, particularly the lower middle class. The evolution was over 25 years and the great conquest of this middle class who is vulnerable middle class has now dropped back into poverty. And this is also reflected in what's going on. Third is the crisis of confidence expressed mainly as anti-establishment, anti-elite, anti-status quo sentiment and all the factors that are in the power. The government is the first in line, but also the media, businesses, all these figures of power of the establishment, which are very institutionalized. And this is not exclusive to Colombia either, but it's being expressed there. The other crisis here is social media and technology, which now there is interconnection, algorithms, all these issues reinforce certain beliefs where fake news circulates more than real news. There's a dynamic where we are seeking the context, the reasoning, pluralism, dialogue, valuing differences. Well, clearly this source of information of these new generations and the society, what happens is the opposite. The algorithms are seeking to maximize their profits and not seeking a new society. So this is easy to manipulate and so on. And this has exacerbated this phenomenon. We're seeing this around the world and in Colombia and also in the Israel-Palestine conflict with very concerning issues. Another point is more local. There's a crisis of youth who are the most greatly affected by what's happened, particularly the pandemic. Pandemic left youth unprotected. The numbers are impressive. 27% of young people of age 14 to 28 neither study nor work clearly in the midst of the pandemic and difficulties to study this makes the problem even worse these young people who don't have education or jobs are mainly in the street and this constitutes a great part of the problem then there's a problem of safety illegal dynamics which are ongoing and the topic international topic of drugs which is also involved in everything that's going on and these tentacles are also spreading to many of the phenomena going on with the blockades especially in the southwest of the country 
In this regard, the economy's formal legal economy is mixing with the informal economy. Finally, there is a crisis in politics and lack of political leadership. This complex uh, economical, economic, social, institutional situation requires strong leadership who can understand what's going on. And we haven't had this political leadership, I think, in this regard. I think the government has been mistaken in decisions taken for some time in against peace, against transitional justice, has made a mistake in certain way in how to confront this crisis, how to confront a topic or a problem which was predictable and which has exploded now in the country. And we have to think very carefully how politics will be the only way of getting out of this and providing again the confidence which has been lost. Excellent. Great, Alejandro, thank you very much. I think that uh, you have referred to very important topics and very important ideas that we are going to touch on again. Now I'm going to give the mic to Paula Moreno. She has reasoned about many of these subjects, things that Alejandro has mentioned, channels and rep represent representative channels for the youth to have a say, to have a voice. So we're very much interested in your point of view with regards to this uh, subject. And Michael and my other colleagues in the panel, thank you very much for having me. Thank you so very much for leading this for so many years and for, you know, having Colombia so close to your heart. So I am... Uh, so Alejandro has given us a very complete picture. I would like to touch on specifically on far or two, uh, far or fourth points. I think that we are undergoing not only a political leadership crisis, but we are all undergoing a crisis. I am in the NGO sector and I am undergoing a crisis. I am in my forties, and I think that. Uh, that there's also a generation that has not given answers or provided answers to the, the youth, not only at the political and the national, but also at the local level in the NGO sector and everything. We're undergoing an existential crisis moment and it has touched uh, and it has touched us in a very, very, very hard way this time. So we should try and stop and think about what are the real leaderships of the country needs right why is it that a person has more benefits if they are in one or other circle but which are the leaderships that we need in our country which are the healthy leaderships that we need to encourage to promote so that people talk to people not from a disconnected uh, stance but they actually understand what's going on with these youth and that they talk to young people you know, knowing them, actually, we are not talking about real truth and complete and utter truth because the youth, the young people, they are very well informed. They are aware of their rights and their power. And I say, well, people say things, but then we do other things. So how are we willing to enter into a conversation, discuss these uncomfortable truths, those truths that we sometimes um, talk about, but uh, we do not actually deep deepen into the discussion. So I think that uh, institutions have lacked institutionality. So we should revise that as well. And the third point that I would like to broach is that something which seems to be essential, Michael, but uh, we are all important, okay, in this arena. We are in a country that is very much disconnected where those who give our opinions, in Cali, Medellin, Bogota, we go to the same places, we meet in the same places, our children go to the same schools, universities, and so on and so forth, it would just represent a very small portion of the country. And that very small portion, uh, uh, the very small sample of the country is the one that tries to reflect 
what the country looks like. But then the young people on the streets, they're saying, well, you do not represent me, right? Because social integration is minimum. And although the pandemic has exaggerated and exacerbated this phenomenon, we need to do something about it. We are all important. We have already seen this with the issues of racial issues. What about all of the uh, racism uh, that uh, has sort of uh, upticked and has rekindled again in Cali, Medellin, the, there's a very, very strong uh, pillar of indigenous uh, people. And so um, this is it's like, you know, just trying to fight against your own image in the mirror, right? Because we are trying to be something else, but then we are something else. Also, we need to try and find a way to discover how is it that we are going to live in this heterogeneity that we have in our country. It is very important to do this because it's not only strata one, strata two, strata three of the youth. So my neighbor goes out, he goes and protests on an everyday basis. They belong to a high class, but they claim that opulence and inequality are not all right and that there are people that have a different mindset and they are also protesting okay they are protesting because they feel that something is not right we are undergoing a very very complex situation a very desperate situation we need more answers more responses more solutions okay we need it's quite it's crystal clear and cali has also been my city I was uh, brought up between Bogota and Cali. My uh, family resides in Cali, and, uh, and these people told me this is basic, this is crystal clear, we need solutions. There is an agenda which is quite clear. It's basic, it's employment, it's food access, it's a health, it's quite basic. And I think that we've run short, okay? when it comes to responding and to addressing all of these issues, okay? How is it that we're going to disentangle this huge, huge mess, okay? Young people are not going to forget this. They're going to continue, continue protesting and claiming for these things. So if you'd like me, uh, I don't know, I think that it's okay. I'd like to just leave it here. We are in the phase, uh, in a phase of construction, reconstruction, deconstruction. We have also undergone a de destruction uh, phase two. Why is it? Possibly it's because we have to involve ourselves. There are not, there aren't going to be any saviors or any magic solutions. We don't, we need micro and macro changes, okay? We need to be able to generate a feeling of feedback, okay? People need a response. People need to be heard. They need feedback. That is my reflection. Thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you so very much. It's been excellent, splendid. So I think we are going to touch back on those points uh, that you've made. Thank you very much. So now we are going to go to Maurice Matash, who is joining us from Cali today. Maybe Maurice, if you would be so kind to tell us a little bit about the situation in Cali and why Cali? Why has Cali been the epicenter of this whole uh, complicated situation, which has been the cause, the aftermath? Well, Michael, thank you so very much for uh, having me and for you inviting me and for inviting me, you know, to have this conversation with these respectful guests and uh, speakers. I'd like to try and narrow down, uh, you know, my opinion to Kali, okay? Why do you ask why Kali? And I'd like to just, you know, uh, narrow down my opinion to what I know. I think that I have enough information to sort of understand what is it that has happened and what is it that is happening. So uh, in 2016, 2019, when I was a mayor during my administration in Cali, Cali was the second less poor city in Colombia, okay? We were not the first, we were the second less poor city in Colombia. So now in 2020, we changed the administration, then the pandemic struck and broke 
and then in two minutes we plunged into being the fourth most poor city in Colombia. So what do we learn from this? Which are the causes underlying this phenomenon? Why do you ask? Why Cali? Okay, Cali is a typically city, it's a perfect city uh, for a strike, to organize a strike because geographically it is located in an area where there are borders that are really easy to block. On the west side, you have the hillsides, nobody goes from there or into there. Then on the east side, you have the Cauca River that uh, there are just two bridges, okay? The, co the Comercio Bridge and the Juanchito Bridge. The south area, there's just one exit, okay? Which leads to Hamondin, and then in the north side, there is the Jumbo uh, exit. And so, um, strategically, it is really, really easy to block the city, okay? And it's really, really easy uh, to close it, okay, and to disturb traffic. So there are a series of issues that are aggravating in this regard. There is in the northern area of the Cauca, 20 minutes from, from our city. There you have the Jawa, Villarrica, Santander, Caloto ports. All of the problems of the north of Cauca from the social point of view and from the drug trafficking uh, stands, all of these things affect the city of Cali in a very, uh, very bad uh, fashion. So we have a very bad, very bad outlook in that regard. Poverty is climbing and climbing up. And I understand it in two ways. When we took office in Cali, sorry, I apologize, people, more than 100,000 people just had one meal a day, almost 110,000 uh, people just had one meal a day. When we, when our administration finished, we uh, were able to feed almost all of these people in soup kitchens. So how did that happen? Well, we made a very, very, very large effort. I am nothing but deep, very grateful to companies that have a very, very strong social conscious and social awareness. So we sort of deployed a whole social dynamic to try and address the problem because the problems in Cali had to do with hunger and the youth. Dr. Paula Moreno has, Moreno has already uh, mentioned this. We had a very serious problem ahead and we addressed it. First, things first, hunger. Hunger is really a very worrying issue in the district of Agua Blanca or Ladera. Any mother, what they would do is just wake up and tell their 15 or 18 uh, year old child to say, okay, go and do something and try and fetch something and for lunch because they had nothing. We started to improve that through the soup kitchens through a series of NGOs and companies that were very willing to help us. And they started helping us as a matter of fact to address the problem. So what happened after we were to solve the problem of hunger? Okay, we started, you know, to sort of um, partially uh, solve the problem of hunger. And then what happened? We had this, all of these uh, disturbs of disturbs, we had like, uh, rising rates of, uh, of violence, things that had to do with micro-trafficking of uh, drugs. That's an aspect that is really hard to address in these cities. We found ourselves with a youth, with young people that, and more than ever right now, they have no possibilities in their hands. They are willing to do anything. Paula has already mentioned this young people between 15 and 22 years of age who have zero future. They call them the NINI. -I -I. They don't even work, not even study, no, they don't do anything. It's an acronym in Spanish. So 
So they are the perfect players and the perfect input for any sort of movement. And they are now the, the front men or the leaders, not the front men, but the leaders of the striking Kali. Okay, they are the perfect soldiers. So there are 29 roadblocks inside the city right now, originated and organized by these young people. They have utterly lost trust in the institutions. They have utterly lost trust in their mayor, in politicians, in their leaders, in the police force, in the law enforcement agencies. They have already lost trust and faith in the uh, private companies that help them at a certain point. They have even lost trust in uh, in, in, in many things. And church, the church has had a very major or a major role in that, and they have held a lot. But our situation was very difficult at the moment. What is it that we decided to do at that moment? Well, what did we do? Well, we sort of implemented the, the peace agents. The peace agents it was an organization that we founded in uh, the municipality. And I said, well, look, Mr. Young Person, I'm going to, uh, you know, pay you this this small allowance per month. I'm going to give you a job. We would pay them the minimum salary, the minimum wage per month. But then, in exchange for that, they would go to they would be uh, advised and audited by psychologists. Okay, and they would work, of course, to get that minimum wage. And then we started, you know. Um, decreasing, uh, the, we notice a decline in hunger, we notice a decline in many of these indicators, and it started to work. And that, there's also uh, something which is quite serious about the youth. These young people, when they turn 20 or 22, they fall in love, and then they start dating with a, a, a girlfriend or a fiance, then, you know, they they make love and then they end up having children. And then these, you, these young people uh, began, you know, uh, being under a very, very strong social pressure. And with these peace agents, we were able to recover uh, uh, 2,500 um, young people. So, when we left office, I will never forget that the only thing that we asked the new mayor was, please, we need to bring the 65,000 meals a day to 100,000. And then from 2,500 children, we need to take that number to 5,000. Please, please, please. But they never had a chance because then the pandemic broke and we enter into a situation which really aggravated. And then there's, uh, th th those uh, young people that had a job, they lost a job, people forgot about them, they were neglected. And these neglected youth are the ones that have road blocked the city independently from the strike i am just talking about the problems of the city we are in the hands of young people who have absolutely lost faith and trust in politicians in unions in authorities they have lost faith and trust in everyone so let us try and bless those that they actually trust in to try and solve the situation. This is the real situation in Cali at the moment. And unfortunately, for a year, I, I have not um, been, you know, working much for a year and a half. But then with the strike, I had, you know, to get involved again. And then people ha have asked me, please, could you please step and jump into this whole thing? Because you have a long-standing experience. You're seasoned in this kind of conflict. Now, uh, the industrial sector together with the church, uh, and the, with industrial leaders, sorry, and church leaders, we are trying to come to, you know, to an agreement and start conversations to try and offset the neglect that uh, these uh, young people have been subjected to. So the, the, the big, big, big issue is the neglect of the youth. We need to re-educate them. We need to find them a job. We need to help them. These 
is a very strong commitment that we should take. I think the people are becoming aware that we should, you know, put our hands in our pockets, okay, and try and help, okay? Everybody is willing to help businessmen, the church. I am 76 years of age and we have never seen, we never saw a situation like this one ever before in our life. Thank you very much, Maurice. Thank you very much for uh, your opinion and your contribution. Uh, well, we will continue uh, with Catalina. Maybe you can give us an idea of the role of the security forces, the response of the security forces, and maybe you could give us some input or some ideas on the things that could be done in a realistic, from a realistic point of view, in terms of which has been the international uh, reactions and so on and so forth, Catalina. I want to talk about the make a few comments about what people have said about the origin. I agree with what has been said. The origin is connected to a crisis in credibility and democracy, disenchantment with democracy, poverty. There's also an important background, which is that in this democratic crisis and poverty context in 2019, there were a series of demonstrations or protests which were used by the government. On the one hand, there are credible reports of deaths in the context of the protest. There was a young man who was impacted by wrongly used ammunition by the police, the anti-riot squad, and died. Clearly, he had this, it, this has been documented, and there's no reaction from the authorities. All these things are in, remain in impunity, and the protests lead to a series of conversations of that the government has no method, it's not clear, where does it lead, no gestures of goodwill. So people lose confidence completely in institutionality. The pandemic goes down, uh, the pandemic reduces the level of protest, but as Sergio Jaramillo has said, I made a great analysis extraordinary analysis of what's going on it's like a pressure cooker the protest goes down because people can't go out on the streets because they're scared there's a quarantine there's a lockdown but now people are rebelling even against the pandemic because of a situation which of poverty which is exacerbated so people go out and demonstrations diversify in a way which i think we have never seen before in colombia the origin is connected to everything that has been said and the inadequate course that the government gave it and the situation of impunity, especially the murder that happened. So a protest explodes, which I think we've never seen the likes of. The organized sectors, teachers, unions call for a strike and to these are added regional communities who support, I believe, very often, I believe, with good reason for the pacts which have been made with them. And to this, what is added are these young people in different localities. They're absolutely desperate. They don't see have any hope for the future. All this with new forms of political communications social media which allow Cali youth, which we've mentioned, to go into the street, get organized via social networks in local points. And this, people in other towns in all over the country see it via social media and they all go out on the streets to show their discontent. How does the government react? Badly and late. Not it reacts badly because in the face of such a crisis in Cali of the youth in the streets at points where they are concentrating, the president says, I won't go to Cali because I cannot 
distract the police at force attention. The police has to be to attend to the violent points. You have to go to Cali or somebody from the high levels of government, some legitimate interlocutor should go to Cali to attend to the political demands, the social demands, economic demands. This is nothing to do with the police. The police has to be at points where there are violent actions, but the government with this logic of the that they are using decides that everything has to be attended through the public forces of order as if this were organized uh, by organized groups uh, attacking the state this theory to me is kind of exotic about there's a series of cells which and that all this is organized as a way to threat threaten the security of state and so they're ignoring the origin of the protest and the reasons for it and the diversity of the protest so their reaction is too late and wrong and then the president takes decisions arising from it all started with the presentation of a tax reform the tax reform was removed and yet protests continue to increase because people need recognition people in the streets need the organized groups the youth and the communities they need that to feel that they are being listened to that there is a dialogue that there is a negotiation a conversation that there are people they are human beings who have needs that are being taken into account and the president takes unilateral decisions. He re removes the tax reform. The Minister of Finance leaves. There's another reform, which is the health reform, is also being protested against it. But this is nothing to like a conversation, a serious articulated conversation with these groups. So what does the government propose? dialogues, conversations, but isolated with no method, with no articulation to some of the sectors which no longer believe in the government, because in 2019 they suggested a series of conversations which led to nothing. They don't believe the government because the government has sustained the idea that Pacific protesting is protected in Colombia and all the peaceful protests will be protected but what has happened is there have been controlling acts of violence and there have been some exceptional violence from rotten apples what people have seen in the streets is the opposite there's a structural violence with people who are demonstrating peacefully there are credible reports of 100 people who have died in the context of the protests 15 cases have been confirmed including one murdered police, the other 14 were demonstrators, of which half have been confirmed in Cali by firearm or by blows. And the government still claims that legitimate protest is protected in Colombia. So there's a huge mistrust, lack of confidence in all institution and proposals. There are several proposals on the table, but the government needs to open up and listen. This is not just about public order. They should not ignore the variety of the protest, and they should not stigmatize when there's not credible evidence saying that the protest is generated by drug traffickers, FARC, or ELN, because there's no credible evidence for that. But I don't think this is articulating this national movement of young people who are protesting, and I don't think they're behind the large organized sector. So I think we need to change the rhetoric. This is important. There's already a variation from the president rising from the international interviews that the president had to give. So the president says zero tolerance to violence, but there are still no concrete actions and there's mistrust in the public fo forces of order. So concrete proposals 
are directed to the government changing the rhetoric and accepting that this is a social problem, a serious social problem. This involves change. I can't hear the speaker. This, uh, the internet has stopped. This is essential because what we are seeing is that there's a new arising of these participating spaces. We need to use the constitutional possibilities, which are very rich in participation, particularly local participation. For instance, there is instruments which the state, particularly in the has the government has to debate with the communities, discuss, and these discussions through a popular, popular legislative initiative can be converted into lay, laws. So here we can have goodwill gestures, and based on this change in rhetoric, these negotiation systems in different phases, I repeat, Sergio Jaramillo and De La Calle have made very good proposals. They are expensive experts in negotiation. The third proposal, apart from dialogue, is creating a commission, international, hopefully, hopefully on the Inter-American Committee for Human Rights, a credible, respectable committee made up of technicians, not affiliated ideologically, people who are experts, who are independent, and who can come and report on what has happened because people mainly youth are really furious among other things because of the situation of impunity and the lack of recognition of the violence that has occurred on the streets so to create this mechanism and allow it to come to colombia to review what happened in good faith without ideologies on either side in order to reconstruct what happened and recognize the victims and recognize that the police needs change, among others, to protect the police so that police won't be sent to resolve social problems, so that there will be good recruitment systems, better incentives for police, better systems for social control, all based on an independent committee which could identify what happened and help us to redress people who have suffered violence, including members of the public security forces, and to have clear proposals for reforms to the security sector. These are the proposals on the table, and the most important thing is to know if the government is willing to open, because so far it doesn't seem to be a clear gesture from the government regarding the possibility of taking up some of these proposals. This would be the main question, if the government is willing to listen to those proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catalina. It's excellent. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So my proposal is to, you know, just uh, just, uh, just uh, lay some of the questions on the table and then ask you to be very brief. Maybe if you'd like to comment on what the other panelists or speakers have said, but I, I, I think that first things first, and you know, to start with, uh, or touching on what Catalina mentioned, and what some other analysts have mentioned, uh, somehow the problem lies in the fact that the government is seemingly not willing to respond uh, in an accurate way. They have political limits or boundaries because of the party, political party they belong to for former President Uribe or what we haven't mentioned, but do, do you agree with uh, Catalina that the, the whole the solution is in the hands of the government but they're not doing anything are they able or they're not able which are the boundaries which are the limits um, for the government to act to take action in this regard we haven't mentioned but uh, in an year you are going to go through an election in Colombia in which are the implications of the current crisis which he have all featured, but 
my question is also if you are concerned about this sort of biased or deviated um, election or electoral race uh, do you think that you know all of the canons should be are going to be aiming at the election and not aimed at solving the real-time situations catalina also mentioned uh some other things because there are so many questions there are so many questions on uh, from the uh, participants about the role of venezuela and apparently this is a a point of view which is shared by many colombians apparently what they allege and catalina you mentioned the FARC, the eln you mentioned the role of venezuela I don't know if there, there's proof or there's evidence that Venezuela is playing a part in this and how would this group of people uh, come to the realization or to suspecting that Venezuela has something to do in this. Uh, and also for Alejandro and Catalina, uh, what, what about the fake news, uh, the disinformation, misinformation? How can this be reined in somehow? To what extent is this a problem, okay? Given the situation, and lastly, the international arena, okay? So the US, since we are the inter-American dialogue, how or what should we do the us has had a very long standing relationship with colombia how should washington uh, respond to the situation in colombia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, police force issues government issues what can or could washington do in that regard there are many questions and time is of the essence and then maybe not all of you are, are going to be able to answer questions maybe just if one of you could you please take just two minutes to respond because we need to adjourn our session in 10 minutes or so so i will get started with alejandro paula maurice and we go into wraps up with Catalina. two minutes maurice for you thank you very much michael well since i have only two minutes and uh, i cannot you know put all of the elements in in the same little box but i would like to clearly state the fact that today the most critical issue in colombia are the roadblocks and uh, we couldn't you know be addressing the colombian situation uh, without mentioning the roadblocks i it's not that I want to undermine, you know, inequality, hunger, unemployment, so on and so forth, that needs conversation, consultation, agreements, public policies, investment. We are all in agreement when it comes to that. And we are going to resolve this with a refreshed leadership in that regard. And of course, I, I don't want to touch on that because that's evident. But the issue of roadblocks in Colombia, as we speak, are asphyxiating the productive apparatus production and the economy and this phenomenon is affecting the fundamental rights of many colombians the right to health the right to food access the right to mobility uh, to moving freely in this day and age people from rural areas cannot go to hospitals or to health centers or level one health centers they cannot go they cannot commute because ambulances do not let ambulances cannot go from one place to the other because of the roadblocks they might go but then they cannot return so this is an utterly critical issue this is a very concerning issue we are going to suffer a very very serious uh, unemployment situation a very serious economic situation and of course that has to be tended to then we also have the, the, the minimum wage which is 70,000 sorry 70 billion um, Colombian pesos a year that, that, that's a very big concern this is a country which is 
very seriously indebted because of the pandemic. We know that, but we need we need to put into place a conversation, a dialogue, a conversation to try and have all players in sync to have them, you know, on the same page. We need to uh, generate a new vig vigorous economy so that the wealth is fairly distributed. This is a flagrant, flagrant uh, violation of work, access to food, access to health of millions of Colombians. And nobody is addressing that topic. The topic is there, you know, just floating, dangling. And this is a critical, critical issue that concerns Colombia. We've been for 30 days, almost 30 days, where we've suffered uh, more than 1,500 roadblocks in the developed in the developed world. That is a crime. Okay, so the state has to attend to those issues. They have to solve those issues. Have to come to a solution. No, 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 no. It's not. This is not solved with tanks or anything. No, this has to be solved with a sense of authority. Okay, Res respecting the body and the protocols of human rights. But here there is a critical issue a critical issue in regards of well the economic and social impact uh with that these roadblocks are having or are affecting on people so people have no access to food people lose their jobs they cannot have access to health because they live in the rural areas that's what happening today that's the most critical issue i think that we should you know just in if, if we're talking about a hierarchy of of subjects or, or worries or concern the agenda that should be number one number two because this is today this is real time and one of the other issues that maurice, uh, that maurice mentioned these roadblocks have continued because i think that the protests, they, they all pledge or they claim different things. Um, but then there's also the future of the, the youth and employment is a critical issue for the youth. How are we going to resolve the issue of employment if we have no companies left, if we destroy the productive and industrial sector? So the private sector needs to absorb, they need to employ people. But if there is no private sector left after this economic crisis, how are we going to give people jobs so so this is the asphyxiation uh, of the protective apparatus and all of all the players this is an issue that has to do with the, the whole idea of the state doing something to uphold or to defend you know certain um, rights that are basic so we need conversation we need dialogue and we need also to address the issue of lack of leadership, political leadership. Excellent, very well. Well, I am going to ask, oh my God, it's at 12.30. I hope that the speakers can hold on for hanging there for 10 extra minutes because this discussion and this conversation is so interesting, it's so rich, it's full of good ideas, so I'm not going to give the mic to Paula, Michael. Well, and uh, just two little points in these two very short minutes. Yes, I think that we should be self-critical, above all from all of those who have been in positions of power because if not we are always going to be comparing things well because two years ago three years ago and but many times the form the language the everyday violence that you uh, see for example in Cali that is nourished on an everyday basis okay even language body language or verbal language we say this is a problem we have these the problems in the, up in the north but then we do not talk of what we do not talk about what has happened in the north of the Cauca, what what is it they have done when there was conflict so it, it's not about the district and area or this or that that there are certain districts who have always been subject uh, to roadblocks, they have been subject to pandemics. So many of us do not understand the situation of the people who live, you know, uh, with very little. And many people don't even care about these people who live with very little, 
about the needed, the people, the, the most needed people, the needy, the poor people. So this is quite perverted. So yes, I know what you need. You are the problem and I know what you need, but I am okay. I have no problems. Yes, I am okay. I have no needs, but I know what you need. So it's so hard to establish and to set and to come to a conversation table where we are all at the same, in the same, at the same level, right? So that's why we're always trying to separate as if it were easy, as if it were things were divided in, in, in a e map. And sometimes we uh, have gotten involved in things, sometimes we've done positive things, but sometimes we've made bad, not bad things, but we've made things that were not right because we are sort of, you know, like leading or controlling the country with a rear view mirror. And we know those of us who have been in positions of power, we know that this is what happens. Sometimes we just, yeah, we know that there are problems, but then we do not talk about those problems. And then we sort of linger in this never ending conversation in this never ending dialogue and because uh, some people say well this is not the first roadblock this is not the first pandemic and well i've suffered from hunger uh many times and there's you know there's the youth who say, well, the allies, the rich people, the wealthy, they've always been up there. They've never come down to us. They never have, have come down to these visits. And then the other problem from the other side, well, this is your problem because you live there, because you don't have a job and this and that. So there is some sort of a big, big gap. And this is an emotional country. It's not that people don't care if you tell them People really care about what happens to the other, to the neighbor next door. They really, really care about that. So I think that, that point is quite clear. And uh, I will wrap this up uh, that all, all, all of the help that the U.S. Uh, could give us in terms of vaccination, uh, donating vaccines, trying to speed up the process of vaccination is key. I think that that is something that the U.S. could very much help us in. Then doing something to improve the education um, system. Uh, many people have dropped out of school because they have no connectivity. And they say, well, well, I, I think that it's better to go into the streets and meeting my friends and studying through WhatsApp or through Wi-Fi. So they are really, really, really tired of being locked up. So, for example, in Cali, the mayor mentioned this, the former mayor uh, mentioned this, there are, are salsa schools, the, the dance salsa schools are, you know, marching. There are 500 salsa schools that are protesting. And why? Because they have been closed for 12 or 18 months. So they, they have no way of making ends meet. So this has so many, many, you know, hot spots. And we need to study and to address every single hotspot because there are a lot of people who have nothing to do because they cannot work. So what are they going to do? They're going to go out in the streets. They have all the time of the world either has to fight for something, culture, sports, everything. Okay. When we were 16 or 17 years of age of those who have children, having children who have no resources, who have no agenda, who have, you, you know, no other way to, uh, try and leave things through such as culture, music, or whatever, it's really, really hard. Maurice, the floor is yours. You are muted, Maurice. Ahí me están oyendo? Sí, ahora sí. Can you hear me well now? Yes, great. Well, what I try to do is, I'm trying to make it quite short, but I resonate with Alejandro's words. They're fabulous in the sense that we are sort of, you know, in, in a vicious circle of poverty. Before the pandemic, we were trying to address hunger problems, employment problems, lots of shortages in a nutshell. But now with the strike, we, are, we have found ourselves in a vicious circle that is speeding up and we are uh, tarnishing the productive 
uh, centers, the companies, the private sector, in a couple of days, 100% of the companies are going to come to hold, and that is going to generate a vicious circle. And no matter how many meetings you have, and no matter how willing we might be to try and address these issues, we won't be able to do anything. We won't be able to deliver because we have come to a point in which have we have come to find ourselves in a vicious circle okay of poverty we are all willing to help but what is it that we could do what is it we could do if we are not able to yeah. produce to produce something to be able to help if there is no production yes we are in a vicious circle we don't seem to be able to get out and i am very very sad about something which really really and deeply concerns me and i've been having conversations with uh, many of the strike leaders to try and have conversations with them and i'm really concerned about the level of distrust they do not trust us they don't think that we are going to deliver okay so that part of trust and just uh and quoting paula these are people who are willing to do to risk it all it's okay for them if they die or not. So that's the extent of the anguish, okay? Without money and without trust, what can we expect? We are going to act swiftly because otherwise we cannot continue with this lesson of grievances. This cannot be extended anymore in time. We have to deactivate the roadblocks. We have to deactivate all this turmoil. We won't be able to stop uh, this spiraling unemployment phenomenon, okay? All of the companies are closing, okay? And it's really hard for them to continue producing. So I hope that we are blessed enough uh, to try and find a way to understand each other. Catalina, the floor is yours. The last words. First of all, with regards to language, I absolutely agree with Paolo. I think that the way in which we name and we say things does things, and language sometimes generates distrust and opens gaps. We need to come to an understanding. We need to do something about that. Government should be more aware of that when they talk about vandalism. All of us, particularly the government. What about the roadblocks? Well, the permanent roadblocks. We all roadblocks or whatever happens, we need to be able, what happens with all these violent demonstrations? The, the question is, how do we face roadblocks? What do we do? How do we face and we struggle with roadblocks by never, never neglecting human rights? There was a huge amount of roadblocks, the huge diversity of roadblocks. Can that be uh, faced with security forces well now in the government everybody should be talking about the roadblocks and what do people need people need acts of goodwill because they need to reestablish the trust in the state that has continually betrayed all the agreements they have reacted in a late fashion they have not legitimate people able and in office to uh, come uh, to grips and establish a conversation. Not only do we need better processes, but also need people that are capable of establish that trust about Venezuela. I do not think that there is there is no verifiable um, evidence to allege that Nicolas Maduro is behind all this. Probably this is good for Nicolas Maduro, of course, but I do not think there is any any any. Um, real evidence that Venezuela is behind this. When it comes to international community, the government has the rhetoric that here there has been an international campaign uh, to undermine the Colombian government. Well, I think that the uh, events speak for themselves. Nobody is doing anything to undermine anyone. I think that the events you know, are quite evident. It is very obvious what's going on with certain social sectors. Thank God they, this has been aired and the international arena is aware of what's going on because I think that this has helped to sort of quell the violence. There is a structural violence. It has 
been aggravated, but what has helped this violence not to spiral into something worse is the intervention of the international community because they have reported violence acts or by uh, abuse from a uh, police force and everything. Of course, there are things that generate certain misinformation, but I do think that there, there are uh, clear um, reports, and I think that almost 15 persons have been killed uh, during the protests. Now, when it comes to the electoral context, yes, of course, it disturbs any possibility of conversation and dialogue because the different sectors are the political parties. They, 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 you know, about they are thinking about the political race and the electoral race, and well, they are more, you know, busy thinking about how to, you know, gain positions of power than how to deal or how to quell this situation. Sometimes they want to generate oxygen, resentment, rancor, many things. And we've seen this throughout the history of our country. So what we should do, that's where we, the, the true leaders should show themselves. There is where we should have a government that would be able to say, with independence, independently from the 22, 2022 elections, we are going to do something to solve this problem. We are generate good deed acts. We are going to come to our senses. We are going to talk among each other. We are going to enter into conversations. So I think that little by little, they have opened up and they have acknowledged little by little that the demands or uh, the grievances uh, made by the people were reasonable. And I think that la la late last, uh, I think that yesterday or the, the day before yesterday, there was a communication um, which was very interesting. I think that we need goodwill, uh, goodwill acts or goodwill messages from all sides. We also need to attend the issue of the security forces reform or the police form resources, and then we need to attend the more structural issues. Okay, that some of these structural issues have quick uh, solutions and some other have local solutions. We do not need a constitutional reform. That is the last thing that we need. We need a local solution rather than a constitutional reform, okay, which then we are going to need to divide and to put in force. And then there's politics and all. So once again, there was a letter that uh, was published uh, last weekend we need local participation mechanisms this is something that we need to be to do as soon as possible thank you very much maurice pablo alejandro catalina this has been an, an extraordinary session we've had more than 500 participants joining in more than 50 questions and i am really sorry because for the sake of time we won't be able to answer all of the comments and the questions but it is quite clear that this has generated a lot of interest. It has stimulated a great deal of reflection. And we are really grateful to all of you for your participation, for your questions. And of course, we are going to have to hold more sessions because there are many uh, subjects. But I do think that things have happened which demonstrate the complexity of the crisis, the seriousness of the crisis, and the importance and urgency uh, of thinking about practical solutions, as Talina said at the end, some specific short term and others will clearly take a long time it's clear, as Paula and others said, that these are very deep issues. They, they won't be solved in the short term. It's going to take time. I've been following Colombia for many years. I studied in Los Andes in 1975, and I still, despite everything, I, I still follow. I'm still very optimistic, despite what you have all said, because the country has huge strengths too. And I trust that they will be able to overcome this current situation, which is so complex and difficult. With time and with the will of all the different sectors in Colombia who are committed to democracy and to a solid economy and with 
social peace in the country. So thank you so much. I'm sorry we have gone beyond our time limit. I don't like doing that, but in this case, I think it has been really exceptional. And I'm very grateful to all of you. Catalina, perhaps you can recommend one of the many books you have on your bookcase, which will be useful to shed light on the situation in Colombia. You have a, an impressive collection of books there. And perhaps you could recommend something to all of us to, so that we can read and learn. Thank you so much and we'll keep in contact and I embrace you from Washington and hope that you will take care, uh, stay well and stay in good health, which is the main thing. Thank you so much. Goodbye.